morning. Uh, thanks for joining us for this, uh, I think it's our fourth or fifth virtual Lunch and Learn webinar series. My name is Mike Bellm. I'm the owner of Life Scientific. I wanted to uh, thank you all very much for attending this segment and uh, hope you find it informative. I think those that might be involved in some level of ultra cold storage will have a lot to learn from the topic today. Uh, we're providing these lunch and learns typically at this time, 1145, on the third Wednesday of each month. You can sign into our uh, LinkedIn account, the Life Scientific LinkedIn page, or our YouTube channel and make sure that you're kept current on the upcoming topics. We're trying to make them as informative and educational as is possible. And uh, you'll see from the content below, this is going through a case study from a actual client and the uh, spreadsheet that they had run on the topic of looking at um, Bonson Environmental Specialties solution for consolidated storage over that of a typical ultra low freezer farm room. So just to give you a little heads up on the navigation, this is currently a live stream that is getting downloaded to our YouTube channel. It is going to be available for future sharing, that same link that you received or used to get on to this is what you can send and share to anybody, any of your associates that you may think this will be of benefit to. Um, you're able to watch it um, at any point in time. So, Right now, though, you should be seeing a screen that uh, looks very similar to this. You can put your screen into full screen mode just by clicking down here. But if during the content you have any questions that you'd like to post, what you want to do is hit escape and go away from the full screen and you have then live chat and you can add a question or comment here which will be collected and addressed at the end of Steve's presentation. And then if you wanna go back to full screen, just click this button here and it'll take you back. So um, unfortunately, if you happen to be getting a black screen or are not seeing the content live but just hearing me, that's because the live stream isn't supporting uh, XP or older operating systems anymore. But when this is all said and done and over and downloaded, which will be probably within uh, an hour or so, you can go back and watch it at that time. There won't be the same problem. So um, just to give you a little background, we started Life Scientific in 92 to represent manufacturers of parental production machinery. We specialize in the representation of production equipment largely for um, manufacturing and pharma applications, but in the last several years, we've gotten quite a bit of exposure into some of the other markets, food and beverage industry primarily. We're based in St. Louis and have uh, several engineers that are helping us cover a good portion of the Midwest. So from aseptic environments through container integrity testing and now a couple of new downstream packaging companies we're getting involved with. Our uh, company's been involved in over 5,000 equipment projects throughout the Midwest over the years, so we're pretty experienced at handling jobs and look forward to the opportunity of maybe helping you facilitate a new freezer project if you're so inclined. So um, as I'd mentioned, we've been representing Bonson for quite a while. It's actually one of the first pharmaceutical manufacturing suppliers that our company brought on 
in the late 90s, we were uh, started in life sciences, kind of like Steve. But anyway, Bonson was founded in 1972. It's a market leader in the design, manufacture, installation, and servicing of a really broad range of controlled environmental chambers. Um, they manufacture reach-in and walk-in stability testing chambers, photo stability chambers, of course, the vaccine storage and custom ultra low freezers. Uh, they're based in North Carolina, Raleigh, and have service offices throughout the United States. And uh, Bonson is um, a newer member of the MCOR group and the parent company MCOR is a $7.6 billion a year Fortune 500 company. So pretty good backing behind the product line itself. And today our uh, primary presenter, although from what I understand there are a couple of color commentators in the background that may chime in, but uh, Steve Ferguson is a reasonably new addition to environmental specialties. He started with the company in 2015 and uh, is from North Carolina, went to the University of North Carolina, has over 20 years of experience in the life sciences market and was involved in directing projects with companies like Steris, uh, which we have a facility in St. Louis, and TCAN. His background has been largely in key account management, C-level contract negotiations, strategic planning, and project execution. Certainly, he's been a great addition to our team. And today, Steve is going to give everyone an indoctrination to vaccine storage methodology, methodologies and looking at whether or not it's beneficial to try to go to a consolidated ultra low temperature storage approach and how to compare and contrast that to what is a typical freezer farm, a room full of reach in ultra colds that if you walk in often it's like a sauna because of all of the BTUs that are dissipated from that equipment. And uh, anyway, I'll turn it over to Steve now and thank you very much for um, working on getting this presentation going for us, Mr. Ferguson. Absolutely. All right. Appreciate it, Mike, and, and uh, thank you to everybody for, for joining us today. Um, we are broadcasting live from Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, as Mike said, I'm going to be the talking head this morning, but I've got a room full of smart people with me uh, that if I start stumbling, they'll jump in, or we are going to have a Q&A session at the end. And uh, I, I think we have enough brain power in the room to answer, to answer most of your questions. Um, so what we're going to focus on today is, is really the environmental chamber and storage option aspects. We're not necessarily experts in vaccines or uh, the effects of environmental conditions on vaccines. There are people, I'm sure, listening that have a lot of expertise in that area. We're really going to focus on uh, the, the chambers and the hardware and some options for you. We do have a very good financial analysis we're going to go through at the end that one of our customers, these are, it'll be a, uh, uh, a comparison, a cost analysis comparison that one of our customers did, a very in-depth one that they did when they were analyzing which way to go, and they were kind enough to share it with us. So we'll go through that in the end. So some of the things we'll talk about will become uh, very crystallized in the uh, in the cost comparison that that will that will walk through. So, um, what we're going to talk about one is, you know, start with talking about the freezer farm concept, which is uh, a concept where people use multiple cabinet reach-in type chambers um, in different types of arrangements, and we'll talk about why you may or may not go with that uh, that type of method. Then we'll talk about um, a consolidated larger walk-in type centralized type storage uh, solution and we can talk about why that may or may not work for you 
and then again we'll walk through the uh, walk through the com financial comparison so you can you can see real numbers from one of our our customers. All right, so when you're when you're deciding which way to go, I think the first thing you have to do is look at building consideration. You know, some of the consideration will be initially is an existing building, or are you going into new construction? Because new construction, obviously, you can design it whichever way you want. Um, existing facilities may have some limitations, and that is where uh, you know a, a freezer farm that we're talking about again is just um, multiple individual reaching cabinet type spaces that usually an individual unit is usually going to run somewhere 32 33 cubic feet um, sometimes they're all in a centralized location or sometimes they're scattered throughout a facility i know there's a major facility here in research triangle that i was in recently i think they had 186 units and they seem to be everywhere every every lab you walked in every hall you walked down every place they could possibly find to put uh, to put some of these units they were they were putting them because they needed space but it was in an existing building um, they're currently constructing a new facility to put centralized rooms in um, so but but right now their freezer farm is not so much of a farm it's uh, it's it's scattered it's a very scattered decentralized uh, solution the way they're doing it so the one one you know some of the reasons that you may want to go with a uh, reach in and multiple cabinet type solution uh, is it does provide you more flexibility again particularly in a in an existing facility um, you can you know you can put these in various spaces versus having to find a bigger uh, dedicated space to put a a walk-in room um, so it gives you more fl flexibility. It's less disruptive to uh, an established building. If you ha have a building already built and you're going to go with a, um, a walk-in room, which happens every day, you're going to have to do some, uh, some demo work and some reworking of your building, which gets to be more of a construction project. Um, it is possible, but that, again, people sometimes find it easier to go then with just adding individual individual units. Um, one of the advantages as well is if people want their their product near their work location, so near point of use, then the individual chambers will allow more flexibility for that uh, versus having to walk down to a centralized location. You can scale these over time, meaning um, if you are in a type of operation that you have a certain need for storage or capacity and that grows over time, it allows you to add in, in increments versus uh, going with a, a full scale uh, storage solution. And then um, again, back to a larger walk-in solution. Again, that's, it's, it's a construction project when you build one of these, one of these rooms. They're built on site. Um, you have to have a, a materials and a crew and space and utilities to do that, whereas the uh, individual chambers are considered more plug and play, right? They come in, they're already assembled, they're generally more standard products. Um, you can plug them in. Obviously, you, depending on what you're doing, you may have to run certain utilities, do your qualifications and validations. But again, it's not as big of a, a project per se as a, as a walk-in room. All right, so if you're considering a, a consolidated storage uh, room, there are uh, several advantages that you may want to consider uh, for, for that solution as well. One, it is a more efficient use of space, and you'll see some of those numbers again in a minute when we walk through the case study. Uh, you have centralized mechanical systems. So if a if a uh, like you look at this customer that I was at recently, if you know they had 186 systems, that means they had 186 separate mechanical systems that they have to maintain and look after um, and supply energy to. So a consolidated uh, consolidated a consolidated room will also centralize your mechanical systems. They're much more energy efficient. You have a lot less parts. They use a lot less energy. Again, you'll see that in a minute. And then uh, because of that, you have less 
heat reject rejection throughout your facility. It, it's less taxing on your um, on your HVAC systems and your environmental systems throughout because when you get less heat rejection and less environmental impact, then it, it's also centralized. So you, you if whatever you have to put in, you can put in in one location versus it having an effect throughout throughout your facility. All right, I think we've talked about the less maintenance. Also, um, when you're starting these systems up, um, if you're starting up, it's just pretty simple. If you're starting up one system, then you're then you're qualifying one room, one system. You're validating one room, one system. You're calibrating uh, your ongoing recalibrations and and yearly maintenance you're doing on one system versus a hundred plus systems or fifty or however many individual. Uh, cabinets you may have. As far as um, uh, performance of the chambers, it's easier to maintain a uh, steady steady conditions, a steady temperature with a with one system. Um, you also don't get as major swings, and uh, you don't get as many major swings in your conditions when you open up. Because if you open up a, a smaller reach in cabinet, you have a pretty uh, pretty major effect on the on the temperature and humidity in that cabinet because it's a smaller space and so the impact is bigger. You're in and out of a larger chamber. You don't get the big swings and var uh, variation in your conditions. So you stay within uh, within your specifications more. You have a steadier uh, condition throughout. And you don't get wild swings or you know any deviations or anything that you have to have to explain later. And along with that comes, you know, quicker recovery times. You had less impact upon opening. You can recover much more quick, much more quickly. Um, in addition, as far as uh, redundancy, I know most pharma companies are going to want redundancy. It's a big topic always. It's particularly a big topic right now because of the major weather events that we've had. So uh, it's hot. It's important as it always is. It's even a hotter topic right now. And so there's usually some level of redundancy with a freezer farm concept, um, but generally, I don't. There's generally not a hundred percent redundancy because you're not going to want to buy two X of every chamber that you buy. Um, but with with having a centralized location and you put redundancy in it, now you have 100 percent redundancy on your systems because everything in there is fully backed up. Uh, the larger rooms also allow more flexibility in, in your packaging and container of whatever you're going to put in the room. Um, obviously, a smaller cabinet, you're going to be limited in, in, uh, in what you can put in there. You're going to generally need smaller packaging, smaller sizes, or you're going to only be able to put one, one, one container of something of a, of a larger size. Having a larger room will allow you a lot more flexibility in container sizes if you want to put uh, uh, a variety of type of, of, uh, of containers in there. Um, another, another advantage on these larger walk-in low temps is there's essentially no, um, no defrost needed for these systems versus on the smaller ones you usually have build up and you're, you're going to need to de defrost those chambers. And so again, however many chambers you have is however many systems you're going to have to maintain and service and defrost, whereas we basically can eliminate that uh, requirement from, uh, from the, the centralized system. All right. Any contact, any, any comments from the crew here? We'll talk about that. Uh, yeah, with the uh, large walk-in as well, um, it's a tertiary mechanical system you would have a, a cascade refrigeration system that is completely sized independently to handle the entire load, plus a backup cascade refrigeration system. And we also have liquid nitrogen as well. So if uh, both systems went offline or power was lost, as long as there's LN2 being fed uh, to the building, it would continue to feed to the chambers and keep the chambers at minus 80. Yeah. So that excellent point, um, and and a real life example of that again is uh, several years ago with Hurricane Sandy, 
we had a customer that uh, was without power for without their main power for two weeks. Their only two backup went in, so you've got that third system backup, as Dan was mentioning. And uh, for two, they didn't. Not only did they not lose product or temperature for two weeks, they didn't even go out of spec or have a variation for two for two weeks. So the being able to put an LN2 backup as a final backup system on these is, is uh, can be critical as well. All right, this is just an artist artist uh, rendering of a uh, one of the of conceptual drawing of, of turning a multiple unit freezer farm into a consolidated system. Uh, this one we have a 4C room leading into a minus 20, leading into a minus 80. Now, you're not locked into this configuration by any means. Uh, we basically provide customized solutions. This is just one conceptual uh, drawing of it, but we design these specifically for each customer's needs and, and uh, whatever you need for temperature and space, whatever your building will allow, we do customized solutions. So uh, these aren't off the shelf and you're not locked into this. This is just one concept. So hopefully that'll give you a, a good visual. All right. What we're going to have on the next few slides is a lot of numbers. We're not going to go through all of them. Uh, if we did, this would be a lunch and dinner presentation. And uh, we, want to, we want to stay on schedule. So, so there's a lot of numbers on here, but uh, we're going to try to more just capture the overall effects of them. So again, these are, these are real numbers that came directly to us from a customer on their internal ROI when they were considering which way to go. Um, their ROI analysis. So what they were looking at was a certain square footage that they needed. Um, they were looking for somewhere around 31, uh, 3,150 square feet. Um, well, that should, that should be cubic feet, I apologize. And so they were looking at, they would need about 126 uh, reach in units uh, for, to reach that volume. Okay. They did a uh, energy comparison. So for the 126 units, I, I will spend a little bit of time on this one just because I think it's important to understand because it, it relates to all the other numbers that you're going to see. So for the 126 individual units at two horsepower each, it would take 252 horsepower or 188 kilowatts per hour to operate those. Um, if you add in what they estimated to be the additional energy usage to deal with the heat rejection from those units, you get to 376 kilowatts. They were looking at what level of redundancy they would need. With 100% redundancy, you're adding another 772, but they, can sit, but, they, but they went with an estimate that they currently only had redundancy on about 20% of their units so it was an additional 225 kilowatts, additional 320, 302 horsepower. So total for the reach in chambers to, uh, to power the 126 units, to allow for redundancy, and to allow for taking care of the heat rejection, we were looking at 605 horsepower, 451 kilowatts. All right, now if we look at footprint, because again, we're talking about space requirements uh, for, uh, for these different options. To go with the uh, individual units with redundancy, 20% redundancy, you're looking at 6,804 square feet. Now that, that encompasses the uh, required space for the chambers themselves plus area around them for airflow and serviceability. So you've got to have obviously space to get to these to maintain them, service them. So it requires about three foot of space around each of those chambers. So those numbers are in here as well. If you look at a consolidated approach uh, for the mechanical systems on, uh, on, on this one that they put in for the uh, 3150 cubic, there was a 
10 horsepower refrigeration compressor. It was a 10 horsepower compressor for dealing uh, for providing dry air and a two horsepower compressor for providing ambient conditions. So total for this, for the equivalent system in a consolidated walk-in was 22 horsepower and 16.4 kilowatt to give an equivalent, uh, equivalent storage space. And so it's 22 and 16.4, compared to 605 and 451. So again, a very significant reduction in energy requirements for the walk-in space. All right, so putting these side by side, um, you can see the uh, footprint requirement, 5,760 square feet versus 627 square feet. And again, walking through, uh, we're just repeating myself. <laughs> the kilowatts per hour, 451 versus 16.4, 605 horsepower compared to 22 horsepower. So the perception may be that the bigger rooms require more energy and, and, and lots of consumption. The reality is that by centralizing it, it significantly reduces the mechanical requirements, significantly reduces the energy requirements, significantly uh, reduces the space requirements. Okay, I don't think anybody wants me to walk through this line by line. <laughs> well, what uh, what they did here again was trying to get at first year numbers for uh, for energy cost, for uh, the cost of installation, for the cost of startup qualification, validation, uh, electricals, uh, the defrost cost, um, the HVAC impact on the facility. So they wanted to, to capture all of the annual cost first year into this. For the 126 um, reach-in units, it was 4,167,000. For the individual consolidated room, 277,900. So again, significant, significant uh, cost savings between the two. Then they looked at a five, the five-year uh, financial comparison with the equipment cost. So again, looking at the 126 units, we they plugged in a cost of 20,000 per unit. Um, probably only a couple of companies that make pharmaceutical grade with the right control systems, the right data logging, the right integration into building um, IT systems. And, uh, and, and we would be one of those, but our competitors were all priced about the same. So 20,000 was a pretty accurate number for the type of system that we would sell for this application. So the initial equipment cost would be uh, two and a half million we were able to build this room for them for, for the equivalent space for 1.3 million. And if you looked at the uh, five-year energy consumption and maintenance cost, uh, they came out with a five-year total for the, for the freezer farm at 10 million, about 10 and a quarter. They came out with the consolidated uh, solution at 2.2 million. So, um, again, this was, I think, them for sharing this with us. They went very in-depth to try to capture everything they possibly could uh, for their internal decision, and um, I think the numbers are, are pretty significant. Anything anybody else want to add? Okay. All right. I've talked enough. Any questions uh, that we can help with on this? Mike, you still there? I am. All right, I'm trying to. I'm having a hard time seeing if there's questions. Do you guys see any, Mike?
Oh, we actually have a couple of questions right here on the sidebar, if you can see them. Okay. All right, let's see. What's the most likely area we need to dedicate for what they have in the storage? Or should we stick to what the paper storage is? Or the paper storage does it start to make sense? And then about consolidation. I mean, you should be saying that. Yeah. Let's see. I just caught the tail end of that. Um, as far as the, um, how many freezers does it make sense? We would, about 40 uprights, about a 25 cubic foot, is about where we begin to, to do the break even point. So anything greater than 40 would start to make sense for this, either whether you're replacing or looking to do new. Um, just because our systems are so large and the mechanical systems are, are quite big, they have a pretty, pretty large initial cost. So the 40 units and above is about the break even point. Yeah. Everybody doesn't see the question. The question was at what point should you start considering going to uh, the larger room versus individual individual cabinets? So Stan said somewhere overall around the 40, or 40 point would, uh, would be where you would get a break even on cost and, and, and energy. <coughs> Those stats, like before and after, or an estimate. Um, the stats that I put up were uh, the the for the consolidated room. Those were estimates. Um, they they had existing individual chambers, and they were considering going to a consolidated room in a in a new facility. So they took their actual numbers and then uh, put some some uh, there were some assumptions in there, but. Um, but it was for the same facility. That makes sense. It does. Can yeah. you hear me, Steve? I can hear you. Good. So I had a situation where a client was using a number of reach ins and one of the issues was with the backup system that they were utilizing. I mean, they did have a few extra sitting in abeyance, but the equipment was set to automatically, if there was a deviation, automatically go into a liquid nitrogen backup. And a problem that they had was that the temperature deviation from that liquid nitrogen backup system that was on the regen was significant, took the product out of spec, and they wound up having to trash the whole load anyway um, because they were, I think, directly expanding into the chamber and it also wasted the ultra cold in the process. So they not only lost the load, but they uh, lost the freezer. So, and I think that there might be a number of customers that are a little bit apprehensive of a typical liquid nitrogen backup system as a result of things like that occurring. Could you explain the difference between the LN2 backup system that's typical on a reach in versus the approach that Bonson utilizes? Dan had mentioned um, a little bit about how it is the third in line to kick on should the redundant unit go, but um, what's your approach to handling that? Oh, okay, Mike. For, for the reach in, we really don't have anything uh, because we don't right. make the minus, the minus eighty reach in. And, mm -hmm. and just to reiterate again, on the walk-in side, um, the three levels of protection. You know, the, you have the A system, the B system, and then the liquid nitrogen backup. So if the A system goes on uh, down for whatever reason, there's there's fault alarms and things on there that will tell the, the B system that. Um, the A system's beginning to have problems, you need to come online. So that backup system will come online while A's taken off. And for some reason, if both systems are offline, the, the controller system will, will know that 
and it will begin to bleed in liquid nitrogen. Now, the nice thing about the liquid nitrogen system we have here is we have needle valves set in to the LN2 valves, whereby it can't run out of control. It only can go down to like uh, minus 70, minus 80, because the needle valves prevent the LN2 from uh, allowing more LN2 in to drop the temperature even further. So it, it safeguards the system. All right, now that, what uh, Steve said earlier about that uh, company, it's for Super Storm Sandy, that was set up to be minus 80 on the LN2 backup, and that ran at minus 80 for the two weeks because the needle valves were set up to do that through the liquid nitrogen. And that feeds into the uh, controlled evaporator? Uh, there's a separate LN2 coil. Okay. And the, the gravity coils on the minus 80. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Marco, did we have any, yeah, how much operational time uh, you can last on backup power? is a question that had come. So I would imagine they're uh, talking about liquid nitrogen or emergency backup. Uh, emergency backup power can be added by just having a backup generator that can be run off of diesel, propane, or natural gas. And uh, exactly. if you have it piped up, then off of uh, natural gas, you can run that ad nauseum. But I would imagine as long as you're filling the tanks with liquid nitrogen, that can be run ad nauseum as well. Is that correct? That is correct. Excellent. And use Mike with that with a two week duration. Um, again, uh, they couldn't get the mechanical systems online, so that liquid nitrogen by the second or third day, you know, the bolt trucks are being sent out to fill the LN2 uh, tanks up. So as long as there's LN2 in and around the neighborhood, and the trucks are being delivered that unit can stay on indefinitely um, just with the liquid nitrogen. So I would imagine that every time uh, an LN2 system for one of our consolidated units has activated, Bonson's been called in for um, startup or uh, service evaluation. So how often are those backup systems going to the LN2? Um, as far as for like an emergency or as far as just uh, clients exercising them on a periodic basis? Emergency. Um, I'm not aware of a, a lot of that happening. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's happened a couple times with a couple of different areas for various reasons. You know, you lose a compressor and um, a, a backup system on the minus 70 the B system went down when a gentleman was replacing the compressor on the A. So we truly had a complete mechanical system down, but the liquid nitrogen came online and we had pretty much, a, if you want to call it a successful failure. And again, I, I know in the 15 years that we've been doing this, um, I'm not aware of every incident that occurs. If it does occur, it happens very infrequently, but there's never been product loss in these type of chambers. Yeah, that's what I've understood. And a lot of times the financial comparisons, while relevant, pale in comparison to the value of product that goes into these chambers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and ultimately, about... it's the uh, system itself and the uh, integrity of that operational performance that can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It, it's as Dan said, and I. It, you know, we're only aware of a few times that it's truly been from an emergency, but when it, when they do, it's very critical. And uh, I think having that system on there helps people sleep at night. We're working on project right now. We're building two chambers. Um, each chamber will have over a hundred million dollars worth of product in them at all times. And they didn't originally have the LN2 backup spec on them. But, Comparatively, adding LN2 to these systems isn't, isn't very much additional money. So when you look at worst case scenario, the system goes down and you lose that much value product for just a small add-on, uh, 
most people are going to go with the safe method and, and mm -hmm. add the backup system. Okay. Hey, uh, we had uh, another question that popped up relative to the artist sketch. You separate chambers interconnected. Are you able to construct a single unit with multiple chambers that are isolated from each other? Or would they all be individual units? Let me see if I can bring that slide up. Single unit you know, with multiple chambers that are isolated. Um, I wonder if he's talking about each bank. Like that bank can be over here, a bank can be over here. And run it off a single system. Yeah, and that's just, yeah, because you need to have a separate minus 24. Right. And dry your purge for it. Right. So in the art, in this version, Bob, who generated the question, and thank you, uh, we're showing that you've got a couple of antis that are walking up to the minus 80 area. Right. And a lot of times there's going to be storage requirements that you're going to have four degree and minus 20, and it can make a lot of sense to do some preconditioning. Uh, so the hallway in the minus 80 zone is going to be uh, brisk minus 20, but that can help with the amount of um, temperature that drops out of the chamber during a door opening and also control uh, ice buildup. Another uh, installation that we have here in St. Louis does not have the four degree or the minus 20 on the front end. Uh, actually, it just has a number of large chest style units that are centrally controlled by Bonson's mechanical system. And when you go to a chest and open it, you don't have as much temperature dropout from the opening event. And that's certainly a way that we can provide individual units without having the different rooms around it. So those chambers are mounted in a um, 70 degree C room. So at normal operating temperature, they're big and they have stairs that you walk up when you open it and it's a little bit arduous to get sample out of that configuration but certainly it's a different way that this can be installed yeah okay so bob gave a little bit more detail on this question mike and i think mm -hmm. So, Bob, I think the answer to your question is is yes. We could have, again, this was just one uh, one way of doing it. As Mike was saying, here one room is used as preconditioning, actually serves as preconditioning for the next room. But we could put exit doors for uh, each of those segments. So we would have the rooms would be isolated. We can have interconnecting doors in internally, but you could also have exit doors. Mm -hmm on each individual uh, area. So we can we can configure it however we need. We can configure it as one one unit with mul with multiple chambers or, or you could you could operate them as individual chambers by having uh, those types of doors. I hope that answered your question. Good. Okay, well, hey, Bonson people, Steve, Dan, everybody, thank you very much for your time and preparation and helping us uh, educate some of our clients a little more. And again, for those that are on, this link is shareable. I think it's quite valuable information and clearly from the financial spreadsheet that was provided to us by one of our clients, the savings can be quite substantial, but so too can be the insurance policy of protecting your product. Um, 
I did want to let you know that our next program is going to be on November 15th at 11.45. And what we're going to cover, uh, probably me, will be covering the Fedegari solution for washing, sterilizing, and also doing chemical decontamination in the same chamber, sometimes with the same cycle, usually not chemical decontamination, but the equipment can serve as a pass-through for the chemical side, but also can serve as a washer and sterilizer. And providing that capability, having a sterilization chamber for a washer means that your washing can be uh, added with a steam, pressurized steam cycle to help the efficacy. And it also means that during wash, you can pull vacuum. So the product comes out 100% dry as a result of the vacuum in some of those impossible to reach spots. So we're gonna discuss that, but then also when designing a facility, how combining these two types of equipment that are usually separated by clean room space helps to save on the overall size of the facility, the cost of the facility, the amount of utilities that are required. And in fact, a lot of the same things that were covered on Steve's spreadsheet in the financial comparison are some of the advantages of going to a more consolidated approach. So I'll be covering that with Fedegari next month. Hope you can attend and thank you again for uh, attending and to Bonson very much. We really appreciate all the efforts. Hope you guys have a great day. Thanks everybody. Bye.